The following program was provided by an independent producer solely responsible for its content. The opinions expressed do not necessarily represent the views of this station, its staff, board of directors, or underwriters. Dedicated to empowering you with information, to make positive choices, and be advocates for your overall well being. Welcome to The Health View. Welcome to The Health View. I'm Yvonne Dunnett, and today our topic is about bullying and sexual harassment in schools. My guest is Amy Jo Muscott, and she is the Education Coordinator of Bridges. Welcome. Thank you so much. We're so delighted to have you here, and let's delve right into it. What is bullying? Bullying is actually um, an imbalance of power. And so uh, when someone is being bullied, it means that somebody is taking power and control over them. In the same way as is domestic violence, when there is that kind of imbalance. So it's a shift, and it can happen in many, many different ways. But it's when one person is comfortable, one person is in control, and the other person is disempowered. And what is sexual harassment? And sexual harassment is a type of bullying, but what it is is basically creating that power and control, but by making sexual advances or advance, or, um, coming together with someone in a way that does not make them feel comfortable. So again, it's all about the balance of power and control. So how does one know if they are being bullied? It's basically about how comfortable you are. And when we go into the schools, we really try to help students understand that if they're getting that weird, yucky feeling, mm. chances are something is not OK. And could you give some examples of bullying? Well, bullying could be on the playground. That's how we used to think about it always. Mm -hmm. um, and it actually starts quite early. But bullying also can happen online. It happens in many different ways. But the idea is, is that there are things that are communicated that makes one person feel very uncomfortable and to disempowered. The, yeah, and to the point that we have had people that uh, through cyberbullying or bullying in the schools that have actually taken their lives. They have. They have. But more so, that doesn't happen as often. Mm. The fact of the matter is, is that what we want people to understand is that there is a dynamic that's kind of insidious, and that if we can identify it and recognize it early, we can address it early and give children skills so that they can take care of themselves and advocate for themselves, the people they care about in their communities. So how can we advocate and what skills do we need to so give? So the skills that we give, I actually work with preschoolers Great. and all the way up to adults. Okay. And with preschoolers, it's a question of helping them understand comfort and discomfort, helping them understand what is okay and what's not okay, helping them understand how to ask for help, and basically helping them have a good sense of themselves so that they can communicate their needs and their wants. And in schools, you start as early as preschool, you said, yes. and it starts young. Yes. It may also start within the family unit. It absolutely does start within the family unit. And what do you do there in order to support children that are going through those dynamics within their own home setting? It's very hard. We actually do have services for kids, um, but part of it is trying to help them see modeling that is healthy. Part of it is also creating an atmosphere where they have trusted adults that they can talk to and where they understand that they deserve respect. Give some description of modeling, of modeling of best well, behavior. I mean, yeah, so, so let's say that you're at home and you're a young child, you want to see adults treating each other respectfully, without name calling, without power and control, right? You want to see people mer uh, mutually working together, sharing responsibilities, uh, being kind to one another. All of those are things that are very, very important for kids to see and to sense. And this grows with them as they grow through Absolutely. the years as they age. So if it's not really looked at at a young age and addressed all along through the aging process, it can get out of hand. 
Yeah, it can get out of hand, but it also can really impact their lives. In what way have you seen that? Well, it's, it's also in terms of their brain chemistry. If they're put in a situation with lots of trauma, it actually changes their brain chemistry. Mm -hmm. And their ability to have um, uh, brains that function to help them regulate themselves. So a lot of the time when we see kids that look like they have attention deficit or that look like they have different kinds of depression or anxiety, a lot of these things kind of look the same way, they actually could be impacted by trauma. And it's something that actually teachers are looking very closely at now. And what are teachers doing as being available as a resource for students all through from little ones all the way up through high school and college? Right. Part and of it is that, pe that all of us, whether we're big people or little people, really need to feel heard. We need focused attention. We need support. We need a space where we can feel safe. And in families where that isn't you know, that isn't available or that isn't happening. Schools are another place where kids can gain that sense of, of space and safety. And what is being done in the schools to create that space of safety? Well, there's, I mean, school counselors go into the schools and particularly elementary school or, you know, for, with younger students and do a lot of work with them. There actually are competencies. There are healthcare and counseling competencies that are part of our education system. So there is a lot of education that's happening throughout um, a student's school life. Um, we try to do a lot of, um, work with them at the younger ages where they can understand conflict, you know, conflict, how to manage conflict, how to manage stress, how to interact with others, how to feel safe, how to self-regulate, um, and how to calm themselves. I mean, you know, you know that babies that can calm themselves are more successful. And so we try to make sure that, that kids have those skills that they need. From a bullying perspective, where in the time period, age period, do you see it mostly happening? It's happening mostly statistically in the middle school years, mm -hmm. but it happens also a lot before then. Um, it's just, it's because it can be something that is, that is almost non-recognizable, I mean, in that it's not necessarily verbal or blatant, it's something that's much less blatant something that's more subtle. And part of what kids need to under, you know, need to learn is how to navigate that, how to read body language, how to understand what boundaries are about, all of the things that we need also as adults, but they need to practice those um, when they're younger. And what can parents do to support their children who believe that they may be being bullied? So part of it is giving them bystander skills. I think a lot of the time there's a temptation um, to overfunction for our kids and to take away their power by doing that, not letting them learn on their own. And so it's really, really important that, um, that they're given skills and that they're, that they're given skills so that they can have support in managing conflict rather than having the conflict managed for them. Can you explain some of those skills? Yeah, so um, for instance, if someone is being bullied at school, um, whether it's online or not, mm -hmm. what you can do is give them specific language, um, give them strategies. For instance, kids do much better or people can address bullying easier when they are with, when they are with their peers. Um, those bystander skills give them strength because they can work together as a team rather than by themselves. Because we know that people are safest when they're in safe environments, when they're with the most people, mm -hmm. right? And so the, the question is to create as safe an environment as possible. Um, so we try to set up strategies, try to teach them strategies so that they can actually de-escalate de when somebody is escalating towards them. Can you give an example of that? So if somebody is yelling at them, okay. rather than yelling back at them, mm -hmm. you want them to be able to not yell back, mm -hmm. to possibly get calmer, mm -hmm. to possibly walk away, mm -hmm. depending on the situation and the age. Mm -hmm. um, and if they're actually trying to communicate, and no, no one can communicate when they're escalated, yeah. 
because we're in our amygdala brain, so there's no way that we can, we can do that. You want them to be able to calm down and then to s speak to the person that they want to communicate with, with an I message, focused on how they're feeling, expressing how they're feeling, rather than addressing combatively the behavior of the example, other person. An example. So if somebody says, you know, I, I really hate the way you look, the way you do something, rather than, rather than necessarily saying, you know, um, uh, how could you say that? This is my favorite shirt, blah, 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 my mom just, whatever it is that they're going to respond, to be able to maybe compliment the person back. Okay, to basically calmly, calmly get to a point where they're almost putting the person um, in a situation where they might feel kind of off guard because they're not expecting it. Um, it could be also learning to recognize signs because throughout our lives and throughout our our, our daily our daily lives, we there's a lot of things under the surface that are constantly going on that really are not okay. Somebody gives us a disrespectful look. Mm -hmm. Somebody gets too close to us in the supermarket line. Mm -hmm. Somebody says something very, very rude or possibly says a joke or something that makes us kind of uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Rather than waiting until it's a situation that's escalated and trying to address it, it's much better, if possible, to address those things at the low level because the low level has the highest frequency and the high level has the lowest frequency. And when you speak of frequency, what do you mean? Frequency in terms of how many times it happens. So in our lives, we see a lot of these behaviors around us, whether it's in the news, whether it's um, on the playground, whether it's at a gas station, we see it everywhere. And the idea is to try to recognize it and also to recognize how it makes us feel so that we can address it in a way that makes sense. Sexual harassment, how okay. early does that begin? Well, it means sexual harassment can be, can be at any age really, right? right? Because it's crossing that boundary mm -hmm. and crossing a boundary in a way that makes somebody uncomfortable. But the advances are sexual in nature. It could be touching, it could be getting too close, it could be whispering in somebody's ear, mm -hmm. it could be telling jokes that are off color for somebody or not comfortable for somebody. And so the idea is, is that in our lives we deserve respect and we deserve to feel comfortable. And if we're in a situation where we're not feeling comfortable, where somebody is making references that really, really disturb us, chances are something like harassment is going on. And so sexual harassment is basically crossing those crossing that boundary. And part of what we try to teach kids is to understand where their boundaries are because my boundary is very different from your boundary. And my boundary with you might be very different because I just met you versus my boundaries with my family or with my very close friends. And so we try to help kids understand the different levels of communication and interactions and how they can kind of step up or step back, how to scaffold that so that they can advocate for themselves in the best way. And what are you seeing related to how often people are getting sexually harassed? And is it more females versus males, males doing it I to females? I think that it happens in, in, in any situation. I think that also in terms of sexual harassment or sexual assault, we think about it more. And I'm sure that the occurrences are more in terms of women rather than men. But gender violence is all about, which is sexual harassment, right, because it's about gender, is about that definition of gender differences and that definition and those assumptions that put us in a situation where we might be uncomfortable. So it happens between men and women, women and men, men and men, women and women. It can happen in any situation and the idea is how to recognize it so that you can advocate for yourself and feel safe. And students and their teachers and students Absolute, and their coaches absolutely. and different people absolutely. in their lives. So what do they do? What so do they what do? We do? So we have a lot of different programs that we bring to the schools um, and this is something that not only crisis centers bring to the schools prevention coordinators or you know pr uh, education uh, prevention people but also staff now are working school districts are working really hard to understand what kids need to be successful and the challenges are so much more because now 
a lot of things are being communicated in a way that can feel more anonymous. And so there's a lot of noise that our students are trying to manage every day. Um, and they don't go to sleep like, you know, older people like us used to go to sleep. They're up a lot of the time trying to navigate relationships, try to understand the messages that they're getting, which could get really distorted when they get them online because they don't get the same kinds of cues. And it also is that they can't communicate directly because what happens is if they're communicating, let's say, on social media, they're, they're concerned about everyone the loads and loads of people that might be seeing that message and how they're going to address that. And the anxiety and stress from that can be tremendous for kids. Absolutely. So how, is, how do students get help and what are the resources out there for them? Well, the, the schools, again, are becoming more and more savvy. And, and this is throughout the United th States. Throughout the United States, but I mean we are making great strides here in New Hampshire. Um, but I think that part of it is really trying to identify what children need and also a recognition that social emotional learning is really an important basis mm -hmm. for other learning. And that the more safe and comfortable and valued and validated and respected a student feels, they will be that much more successful in terms of their academics or their interactions with others. You know, sometimes there, there's been um, an example of locker room talk. Yep. How can that change? Well, locker room talk is kind of a hard one because, as I said before, that kind of comes from our rape culture right from that gender that gender lens where it's okay for certain people to talk about certain things mm -hmm. but what we say is it's really not okay at all exactly. it really isn't and there are actual curriculums that are evidence based and research based that actually address those particular those particular issues and a lot of coaches and and athletic directors are now looking for that kind of support because they believe that good team players really have to also be good human beings so they're addressing it very very directly and from an adult perspective adults may have gotten used to a prevalence in society of certain ways that people act absolutely they need to change it up they do need to change it up. How? And part of it is, again, thinking about what makes them feel safe and then thinking about what they can do for that safety. And it's different for every person. Mm -hmm. um, but it's important to really think about that because I know that we've all had those feelings when something just, it just, it just f makes you feel kind of yucky and awful. And taking the responsibility to Absolutely. not put those feelings on anybody else. Absolutely. And, and a lot of us put those feelings back on ourselves. Mm -hmm. And that becomes its own barrier and obstacle to success. Because victim blaming and self blaming is something that's very prevalent. Um, and it surrounds a lot of what we do. So are there legal ramifications related to bullying and sexual harassment? There are. Um, there is now actually, um, there are a lot of bullying laws in place, mm -hmm. um, which actually, um, where they need to be investigated. So mm -hmm. if somebody brings a complaint, they do need to be um, really investigated. Mm -hmm. There's something called Title IX in colleges, which is really um, a way to make sure that students feel safe on campus. Um, and so there are a lot of different ways to um, to address this, but part of it, part of what makes it hard is that it's really a cultural shift. It's not just about students. It's not just about educators. It's not just mm -hmm. about people, um, you know, in the workplace. It's about our society. It's about our society and where we are. Absolutely, and shifting and our what belief we become. system. Absolutely. So it's about really shifting our belief system and also understanding that everybody can stand up and, and do something that's safe to protect themselves and to also, you know, be a, be a good helper to others. So they can make a difference by starting with themselves. That's exactly right. Starting with themselves, being more sensitive, more aware, knowing that more what present, they say, more present, present and knowing yeah. that what they say can in fact impact other people impact other people absolutely and i think sometimes it's hard when you you know to really think about it that way it's hard to be vigilant 
Mm-hmm. And um, and that's really what we're we're asking of our ourselves, society, of our Everybody. society and ourselves. Absolutely, to, to be, be vigilant, to be vigilant and aware and supportive, um, and to be willing to to try to make changes in a good way, in a good way, and Absolutely. really looking at people and respecting them and caring about them and really role model- modeling good behavior. Absolutely, and good behavior to you is what. Good behavior is a, a, a place where everybody deserves and has the respect that they need. I mean, healthy relationships are mutual, right. and they're healthy, and they're nurturing, and they're nourishing, and they're happy, right. and they're and they're you know dynamic, and they're fun. I mean, not that people don't have bumps, but they're all those things. And we learn the skills and the resources to help us through those bumps. Absolutely. And speaking of resources, what resources are available to people at at the different stages of their lives, from children to teachers to parents to community members? What's available to them? So so, um, I'm from an organization called Bridges, Mm -hmm. which is one of 13 crisis centers in the state of New Hampshire that supports victims and survivors of domestic violence. Mm -hmm. And each state actually has a coalition against domestic violence and underneath supports a group of crisis centers. So So domestic domestic violence under under that that component is also bullying and sexual harassment? It is, of course, because domestic violence is about one person taking power and control over another. I mean, bullying is power and control, but it's intentional Mm -hmm. and it's repetitive. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. And so it is. It's, It's... Bullying is domestic violence. Domestic violence is bullying. It's just a different form of it. Um, And so there are resources. All of the crisis centers offer free and confidential advocacy. We are not therapists or counselors. We're advocates. We actually can support people. We never tell them what to do because we believe that leaving any kind of concerning relationship is very difficult. Um, and so we support them so that they can feel empowered to make their own choices. And you provide supports and resources for supports them to get the help that they need? Absolutely. We have, we have an emergency shelter. And, and how would people go to that? They would go, they would actually come to Bridges. Okay. Or they could call. There is um, a, a phone number that I'm sure you're going to be sharing with everyone. And what would it be? Um, the, well, the phone number for Bridges, there is a 24 hour support line. Good. And that's 603 883 3044. Could you repeat that, please? Sure. It's 603 833 6044. 3044, I apologize. No, that's okay. Just repeat it one yeah. more time. Okay. It's 603-883-3044. Okay. And from a national level, that would be within the state of New Hampshire? That would be within the state of New Hampshire. But the state of New Hampshire is kind of funny because what happens is that calls go to the closest crisis center in New Hampshire. Okay. And I'm sure that each state has its own system for doing that. And if someone was out of state, visiting out of state, living out of state, they where would they get bridges. help? They could still call bridges. Bridges, okay. and we can still help them. And we are open for calls during the day in the office, but people always can call us and come in without an appointment. Excellent. And what other resources are available okay. to people nationwide? Okay. So nationwide, everyone does have a crisis center. Okay. And in those crisis centers, there are um, there are support groups. There is help with court and filing restraining orders and stocking orders. Um, we also go to the hospitals, which which people, advocates do to support people when they've been sexually assaulted Mm -hmm. um, so that there's emotional support. We actually work in communities, and this happens all over the country, to connect people to the resources that they need. That's wonderful. So if you were to summarize the services that you provide and the things that are available to support people related to bullying, sexual harassment, domestic violence, um, violence. What are they? I would say that they could come to Bridges for advocacy, support, and also for uh, connections to other uh, resources that we know about and that we can help advocate for them um, to receive. Um, We also do prevention because we believe that if people understand what healthy relationships look like and what concerning behaviors look like, that they can be better advocates for themselves. And what type of prevention do you do? 
we do many different kinds of prevention, but it, we do some um, bullying lessons in classrooms. We do um, different uh, different lessons on boundaries. We do lessons on um, and work on te teen dating violence and healthy relationships. We talk about issues in relationships that kids need to know about depending on where they are developmentally. And do you do anything online where someone could actually go to your website and learn about the Absolutely. programs and information? So if they even looked, went to our website, there are resources there. Which is what? At, it's bridgesnh.org. Okay. And if they go there, there actually are links to other resources and also a link to the New Hampshire Coalition Against Domestic and Sexual Violence, which is the umbrella organization that has tons of statistics, tons of resources, and different ways that they can get help. But we're all working together to, to help people get the help that they need. Is there a particular website for them? Uh, it's NH for New Hampshire, C-A-D-S-V. Okay, for the Coalition Against Domestic and Sexual Violence. Is that dot .org or dot .org? Okay, yeah. and so people can go there and learn more about from a statewide. Statewide or even there's national information, information. on mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. Excellent, excellent. So resources are free? Res all our resources are free and confidential. And you have 24-hour support? 24-hour support. And how is that? Is that based upon a calling in, a telephone calling number? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. again, that telephone number is? It's 603-883-3044. And when someone calls that number, what type of support may they expect? So when they call that number, what happens is there is, it goes to a, an answering service. It then goes from there um, to an advocate who will call them back within 10 minutes. They can get emotional support. They can get resources. Um, they can just get grounding. Let's say that they woke up feeling really anxious because they're recently separated or they're struggling with some kind of anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, they can just call. They don't have to be in crisis. They can just call and just get somebody to talk to who will help support them through whatever whatever they're feeling. And they can also have an opportunity to get into a safe house situation, correct? They can. We do have, um, we do have different safe houses throughout the state and they're throughout the country. Some of them are in non-disclosed locations because when people leave their abusers, they are fleeing. Exactly. And if they're fleeing, their abusers could be stalking them. Mm -hmm. So there are safe houses, emergency shelters for people. Excellent. And the telephone number that they can call again, which offers the 24-7 support yep. is? It's 603-883-3044. I really appreciate all that you do. It's critically important and raising the awareness and creating a shift within our entire society, starting within our schools, our homes, with our adults, is something that we can all do together to make our lives even better and really help us all to be healthy, happy, and well. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Until next time.